All right, welcome to the Ryan Research Podcast. I'm Peter Ryan, and I'm joined by Sean Keyes, a writer for The Currency today. We'll be talking all things Ireland, economics, different sort of policies. And so I'll turn it over to Sean to give his little biography. Oh, hello, I'm Sean. Um, I'm a, my, my official title is finance correspondent for The Currency. Um, I, I write about finance, but also about uh, cities and economics. And I don't get to write about economic history because no one really is interested apart from the audience. Maybe don't like it that much, but uh, you know, I, I like it. I'm interested in that too. So if the conversation goes that way, that's good. Um, I probably should make re like refer to the fact that I'm in this car. I'm recording in a car. I didn't actually know it was going to be a video podcast, so I thought a car would be good, but you know, a car is fine for a video podcast too. Yeah, the shades work. I, I think it's a good, it's a good vibe that we're setting. <laughs> Um, yeah, it looks, uh, yeah. It's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's actually really bright here. It's not, it's not being, I'm not like being Bono. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah, so um, really appreciate the work that you've been doing. Uh, very insightful pieces. Um, and so I think as a first question, you know, what is your take on the current state of the Irish economy? Oh, um, well, the Irish economy, it's like, it's, it's an unusual one. Like I always like most countries and most places, like the, the challenge is getting enough jobs and investment and like bringing money into the community. And that's always hard, you know, like that's, that's the hardest problem in, in, you know, in, in, in civilization and governance, whatever. Um, but Ireland just seems to have just kind of cracked that with this corporate taxing. There's like, an, like endless amount of, uh, employment, exporting, like all of that employment side, it's just so strong uh, from the uh, from multinationals. And that segment kind of carries the rest, all of the rest of the economy. Um, so that's got a couple of causes. But then the, but then the bottleneck in Ireland is, is different. It's like how it's like actually, it's more the supply side. It's like, how do we use those resources efficiently and well? Like, how do we organize ourselves? How do we, like, obviously everyone talks about housing. That's one big part of it. Um, all of those things, like we've kind of, there's been so, there's been so, such a steady flow of money over the, over the country for two decades. It's, it's sort of just like mixed metaphors, but it's like papered over a lot of problems. We haven't had to be very smart or efficient about how we fixed like, various problems we have we just throw money at them but we're kind of now reaching like a, a bottleneck where th just throwing more money after a lot of problems isn't working and we've got to like figure out the hard problems like looks like i'm like okay like how do you efficiently build housing how do you efficiently build a subway system how do you organize your uh your your health net your health system and, 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 and how, on basis what basis what basis do you employ your doctors all that sort of tricky stuff we haven't figured that out. And then back just sorry to jump back again over to the, the the actual employment side. The other consequence of having all these multinationals is that like the domestic economy is is like atrophied and Irish domestic firms haven't really kept pace at all. Like the the, the hope at one point was that was that um you know all these multinationals will come they'd employ irish people irish people would learn from the multinationals how to be really good then they'd like leave multinationals and start their own and then like it'd be kind of you know we would have to call spillovers and that like the irish domestic firms would get really, really good too that hasn't happened what ha what's happened instead is sort of something more like the metaphor would be more like um that the multinationals are like sucking up all the oxygen or something and it's very difficult for domestic firms to to get their hands on like the, the workers they need the like smart workers will want to go to the multinationals where the wages are higher um so yeah it's kind of resulted in this sort of weird two-speed economy where super strong multinational sector and all the sort of industries that serve them your lawyers and your everything from lawyers to janitors and then oh quite a weak domestic sector and that's me that's the end of it yeah and so where do you where do you place sort of the root of the lack of growth of the indigenous firms? Is is it that all the labor is getting sucked up by multinationals or is there a financing problem that there's not sufficient 
capital that's coming in to power them? What, where do you think that lands? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think, so I did a piece, piece about it for like, so I see at, at the time I was reading this book about um, a book that came out last year called the Power Law and it's about venture capital. And that book was like a kind of a top of the market type book. It was sort of like, it was quite like uh, easy on the venture capital industry and it was written um, and it was written at the top, written at the top of the market. Uh, sorry, I was waving at people outside this car. Um, and anyway, so sorry, the power law was all about the origins of Silicon Valley and the financiers who sort of helped make it happen. And a big part of that story was like, you had like, you know, sparks flying off of these like successful firms, like, and it, as I said before, those like the workers, which I kind of learned about industries, learned where uh, opportunities lay, and then they kind of went off and took advantage of them on their own. But they got like, I'm waving at more people anyway, uh, but they got uh, funding from venture capitalists and from like angel investors. And there was a, a very rich network of finance in the Bay Area, and it's obviously still there, which has like nurtured and that cultivated the industry from there. So I think Ireland doesn't have that, definitely, for a start, right? We don't have angel investors. And that's kind of a self-fulfilling thing. Once you get, like they say, you know, like you can trace the roots of like, you know, a dozen multi-billion companies from like, I guess it was like Fairchild Semiconductor or one of these, like that it's a kind of self-reference, self-reinforcing process. You get a great bunch of people get together. They all get rich together. They... Uh, people go off and do their own thing and then all these rich people are kind of like semi-retired and they're worth like, you know, uh, 800 million and they've got nothing to do but like find the next generation and give them money. So that's a key part of it. We don't have it. And I think there's more to it. It's just saying, I think that that finance side is very important. It's not just the angel investors, which are obviously, which is obviously true, but like there's a whole, the whole, um, on in the US, right? I'm not sure how many of the readers of your listeners are American. In the US, they are very, you, you, you guys take it for granted that a, an entrepreneur can borrow some money, start a company. If the company goes bust, the entrepreneur, like the, whatever, the company goes bust, the, 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 the lenders or the, the shareholders of the company you walk away with nothing and uh, the entrepreneur lives to fight another day. Or maybe he goes bankrupt and then he lives a fight another day. And it's like, no harm, no foul. We'll start again. In Ireland, it just does not work like that. Like there's kind of a, a nod to it in certain ways, but like it just doesn't, that's like that's like the ideal of what we want, but it's much more like, uh, so the basically this like the corporate veil, the idea that a limited liability company limits liabilities of its owners doesn't tend to exist in practice to get funding from Irish banks, you need to be, the, the entrepreneur will usually need to put in a personal guarantee, which means like the company folds, the bank come for you and you get your house. Mm -hmm. So that's bad. Um, so that's from another one. Another one, which is since you're an economic history guy, I'm just, I'm maybe getting a bit out of my depth here, but like, I do think it's probably, I have a feeling it's important um, that like all through the time of Ireland's like currency peg with sterling um, there what we we were kind of one unified financial market and from my understanding Ireland's the Irish bank's role in that was to like suck up deposits from Ireland put them to work where the returns are highest which was the UK always so the Irish banks, particularly Bank of Ireland, even now still have this big legacy UK business. So there's all these, that's, that's kind of going back at the midst of time. In the present day, there's like the, the lack of um, venture slash angel money for the, on the tech, for the tech industry. There's the corporate veil um, for financing of other, of like, uh, for, for like equity financing, say of, of startups. There's, and then if you're not, even if you're trying to get debt financing for startups, similarly, like the Irish banks as a kind of consequence of the, the last financial crisis, the Irish, the Irish banks are kind of a, they look like banks and they, and they kind of seem like banks, but they don't really do a lot of the jobs that you'd need for a, a banking system to do. 
they're so traumatized by what happened. They don't lend to any sort of risky propositions. They are slow to lend to business. So it's hard to get the financing right. So yeah, I would emphasize all those things, but I just, the first one I mentioned, I think is probably the most important. When you talk to entrepreneurs in Ireland um, about like, you know, our, our people, SMEs, like Irish medium sized companies, things like that, about what they see as the bottleneck for the, for growth of their company. They're like, basically our, our workers see us as a stepping stone. And if they're any good, they go work for Johnson & Johnson or Google or whatever. Yeah, so that's being that sort of regional player in a, in a global world obviously has um, that stepping stone quality. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think all those points sound right. And I think, you know, dipping into that economic history, uh, certainly sharing a monetary union uh, effectively uh, through the sort of various hundred years of independence did not really help anything in terms of uh, creating avenues for, you know, um, you know, what China did by devaluing the currency to increase manufacturing output by making their labor more competitive on the global market. You know, that could be an option. Yeah. There was a little bit of that in the 80s when um, things got a little floaty. Um, yeah. the, the economists have mentioned that with Ireland that um, there was some depreciation going on and, and that actually kind of assisted that eventual, um, you know, Celtic tiger blooming in the 90s. Uh, and then going back a little bit to the American side with economic history, um, certainly sort of the cluster effects of Silicon Valley and certain characteristics of how they do their financing are, are unique. But I think maybe taking a perspective like a Mariana Mazzucato uh, type of deal, you know, the reason that Silicon Valley is a cluster is because of like intense DOD funding. And this kind of gets at an interesting intersection of the private sector and the public sector and what role does the state play in actually fostering the development of these, you know, to use another colloquial term, infant industries. So mm. what are your thoughts sort of on what was the Irish state's role in assisting indigenous firms at certain points and what is their role currently? Um, just to go back a bit, I, I, I always thought that there was space for like, you know, the Friedman, Swart, Friedman and Schwartz monetary history of, of the states, which was like, just like reframed everything beautifully, um, that there's so much to do that for Ireland, you know, like, because that, that's that's not the way Irish economic history is told at all, like, mm -hmm. at the, through the currency peg. And like, it just seems so obvious, you know, like you had a, whatever, how many number of decades, like in this like rigid currency union with like a totally much more developed economy, I was like, what else, what would you expect to happen? What what did happen? But like, that's not how the history is told at all. Um, maybe you're the guy to do it, Peter. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, that's, it's, it's, I, I, I pondered yeah. it for uh, a little, well, you know, if I, I think it's one of the, one of the things if I had the uh, talent and application and, and time, uh, I would have liked to have done it, but I think it's a good idea. Um, anyway, so what, are, so, so you're asking about the, about these, the state's role in picking winners and create picking industries. Um, I don't know a whole lot about this, to be honest. I know a little bit of Boblin, and much less than you, I'm sure. Um, I know that they went big on like on on um, on aviation, which didn't pan out for them, but at the time, but then later, really did pan out. Mm -hmm. um, and pharmaceuticals was another one of their big bets, and that was like a, that was a deliberate policy choice. Um, and be, look beyond that, look, I won't waste everybody's time. I know a little bit about it. You might know more about it yourself. Um, and I, I mean. You, well, like, you know, I'll, I'll throw it back at you. So what do you, I, mean, you, you, I think you are a fan of active state involvement in like picking winners, essentially. Like, what do you think of the track record, the ex-ante track record is of that, of six space picking winners and not just looking back at a couple of successes that subsequently turned out to have had state involvement? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously like picking winners and losers has such a negative connotation. Um, there's symbolism of like corruption and and stuff we don't want to do that in a healthy democracy but um you know i would go back to just economic history and i think there's a lot of scholars that really have painted uh the development of many different countries going from you know poorly oh, developed sorry. to advanced Keep, no continue on. um and they've and they've suggested that Certainly there's a dynamism to the private sector, but there is a special role the state plays in guiding 
you know, on a macro level, different industries. Um, and I prefer sort of uh, thinking about that in terms of like tariffs, for instance. And this is actually a debate that was going on in early America. And there were kind of two camps of protectionists. And one you could say was sort of inspired by Alexander Hamilton, the first treasury secretary of the United States. Um, and later more of a, um, another camp that was sort of fueled by uh, the Irish American Matthew Carey uh, economist. And those two camps represented this idea of essentially should the state give uh, subsidies specifically to an individual firm? Should it give it a monopoly? And should that be the way that you protect an industry and, and let it grow to compete on a global stage? Um, yeah, yeah. The, so that was Hamilton's. On the other side, there was the Kerry view, which was you should have a broad-based tariff that will apply in such a way that you're not actually favoritizing, um, favoriting um, one individual firm and giving them a monopoly. And what ended up happening is like you're actually inducing more stimulus to a lot of these rural um, entrepreneurs that are trying to create their own industries in, in different uh, uh, enclaves here and there yeah. versus what Hamilton's actual first idea he, he implemented and kind of failed at, which was he created a, a monopoly in New Jersey that was supposed to be this like mega factory, like think of Foxconn on steroids. And it was supposed right. to just manufacture everything. It was supposed to be this one big manufacturing hub. And it just failed because um, of, <laughs> like for pretty much like obvious corruption problems, you're not using a meritocracy, um, you know, the, in terms of the labor relations to capital, the craftsmen mm. that were actually doing the work hated the owners of capital that were, you know, telling them what to do. And they, you know, they didn't understand the craft. And so what ends up happening is you have a distancing in America of this sort of Hamiltonian view of let's pick winners and losers by like giving direct subsidies and monopoly privileges to one individual firm mm. that we also own versus the Matthew Carey view that ended up kind of succeeding a bit more where you implement a broad based tariff and other things that are that are more sort of uh, right, which, universal. Is, which is like and it's like but even even that it, that's kind of that sort of uh, that distinction is, is between this sort of like what sounds like a kind of a statist view versus a more re relatively liberal one um but like the carry liberal view which is that developing basically developing countries your companies your countries that are in catch-up mode should not trade freely essentially and, and should like build walls around their indigenous industries until they're ready to go like that would be uh i know free marketers who just like cannot get a, get their head around that idea that you know that there would ever be an argument against free trade but like the record of every country that has kind of caught up successfully with industrializations well not not every that's not true but the big ones like your france's and germany's and japan's and usa's that's how they did it right yeah yeah um and there's a there's a great book too like um by a, a Japanese American author from Stanford. I'm blanking on the name right now, but I can put it in the show notes. Um, and what he, he does a fantastic job of really being precise with showing the benefits of the private sector and the dynamism of that, and the benefits of having a state-led direction um, associated with that in the sort of Meiji Reformation into sort of the turn of the 20th century for Japan and yeah. I find that one of the most interesting case studies because you're really taking um, a starting point that nobody can say kind of the Japanese had sort of like kind of an advantage. They isolated for you know centuries. Um, they were so uh, undeveloped compared to the Western powers that they were forced into accepting trade treaties they didn't want to. And so they were in this point of they were either going to probably turn into um, what China did with the century of humiliation, um, or they had to develop rapidly. And so they chose to develop rapidly. They figured out ways to do it. And they did it in a way, like I said, that allowed for a healthy relationship and balance between the private and public. And where I would say like the public comes in too is like on sort of a regulatory footing where like the licenses that would be given to Western firms to come into Japan were conditional. 
And the idea mm -hmm. was that, okay, if we're accepting you into Japan and you're making a factory and you're doing all this, there's like a time limit to it. And there was always an understanding of we're training up our own labor and our own managers. And then at a certain point, we're going to take that and put it in a Japanese indigenous firm. And then you're going to be phased yeah. out as the foreign firm. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's, it just, it just, it just, it just speaks, it just speaks to like, um, like that kind of woolly term of state capacity, but like having a long tradition of having an active state that's trying to solve problems and that's like maybe overdoing it, correcting course back and forth. And so to like, you know, Japan, like modern Japan, like modern the best bits of modern Japan, like it's like its train system or the way its cities are governed, just like this marvel of like just the state does does just enough and it does it just right. And it's so hard to get to that balance, but like and it but you can you just you just know that like they say the Japanese rail system is a product of 150 years of its government diddling and implementing and, and adjusting course and getting better at doing what it does and that like you know you're, you're trying to you're, like for ireland like it's which is so sh pardon my french bad at that um the idea of like our state getting involved in a, in a mess in, in the economy in a mess in a massive way or even like or even like organizing a large infrastructure project it just seems beyond it you know like the state isn't doesn't have that muscle memory of how you solve these problems yeah, and that and that's always the catch twenty two of you know how do you start development and you know if you're not developed, um, and but that's that's like I said why I like the case study of the Meiji Reformation because it really is starting from scratch and, and starting from like you know compared to the Western world the Japanese were like three hundred years behind, um, mm -hmm. and and one of the things they did too it's you know rather than laying it up at the feet of well, the Japanese just have a national characteristic which enables them to be better at managing and, and employing all these sorts of techniques. Um, what, what they did with the Reformation was that they sent a bunch of young guys out to train at universities to, to sort of shadow didn't, and didn't like, um, Didn't like the prince do this or something? Yeah, so all, a, bunch, a bunch of these uh, young Japanese went out, did tours, um, stuck around different countries, America, France, Germany, England, and they would come back and they would have these deliberations where, and it's actually pretty funny because with, with sort of Western history, we get so emotional and we're so tied to like, you know, different movements and political ideologies or different ways of organizing society. And in that time period, the Japanese came back from those journeys and were talking amongst themselves saying, should we do a constant like a republic or what about a monarchy and they were they were debating it in a sense of like you would debate you know which car brand should i go for you know it was it was very pragmatic and they and i think it was that spirit that kind of enabled the ethos of their government like going forward which is um we're being pragmatic we're, we're not getting held up on any sort of you know mental baggage from, you know, feeling inferior or feeling like, oh, we have to isolate. Um, they went out and they just said, matter of factly, like, if that country does it better, we're going to take a piece of that and we're going to do it. We're going to take a piece of that and they're going to balance all these things out. And I think that's, um, I think that's really the, uh, uh, yeah, you do, you do pick strategy. up a lot of baggage. You do pick up a lot of baggage in the process of, thrashing out all these ideas like that's actually an advantage ireland has i think we don't have like some of some of the baggage that we don't have is you know regions of the country which were built up around industries that went became obsolete or whatever we just have like relatively not very dense agrarian empty quite nice and we can um we can if we, if we can get the next part right we can overlay a modern economy on top of it without having to solve for some of those very difficult problems. Yeah, I mean, like the mental baggage of, of Ireland is, is I think definitely there, like after reading so many oh, scholars. It, oh, it's there, all right, it's, yeah. it's, it's certainly there. It's just, it's a different type, but, but carry on. Yeah, I mean, just reading different scholars of like describing Irish economic history. It is, it is amazing just how much, 
uh, unaggressiveness there is in, in challenging like notions that they're just picking up from English authors that were writing about the Irish economy. Um, and so I, I find that ultimately, um, you know, kind of annoying, but there are, there are definitely um, better scholars that kind of get a little bit closer to the heart of the issue um, and inspecting closer. I think Mary E. Daly wrote a great book about sort of the protectionist era of De Valera in the 30s. And she really examines it critically. And rather than I think laying it at the feet of the Irish are just incapable or, um, you know, or, you know, there's some sort of geographic problem, um, you know, just protectionist ideology does not work. And we need to just accept free trade liberalism, which was also just the reigning ideology during colonialism. Um, you know, she inspects it technically and she says, oh, no, this was the problem. Like, you know, De Valera didn't do this. Monetary policy is, it, is a big like one. To, 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 yeah, monetary policy, we were talking about, but like, to my mind, De Valera, I don't, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but to my mind, De Valera, it's, it's one thing to be to do what the Japanese did, let's say, where you have your tariffs and you use your leverage as the government to sort of ex get extract, um, a de uh, you know, extract things from exporters and from, from international capital, international companies, so that you can so that you can then build your own industries and then you can export. And like that's sort of that's been the the recipe for these countries that have industrialized and used that method all all, all the time over history. Um, we're gonna we'll, we'll, we'll set tariffs. Um, we will protect our domestic industries. Um, we will maybe steal ideas from abroad as, as best we can. And then when they're good to go, then we'll off we'll lower the tariffs and we'll see how we get on. And like, but that wasn't Dev's goal, was it? Like, I thought he just he was like just interested in like autarky. He just wanted. He didn't believe in 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 us contaminating the Irish people with foreign goods and services. He just wanted us to be a humble, poor country that was spiritually rich. Which yeah, which was, which was um, sort of, uh, again, the frustrating part because he then absorbs all of the revolution in him as an avatar. And so it's, he becomes this, oh, we tried that. We tried those crazy ideas that those revolutionaries came up with. Love them for breaking free of England, but you know, we gotta, we gotta move on and be adults in the room now and dismiss what De Valera did. And I think De Valera, he's a very unique character through Irish history. And I think in a lot of ways, he's unique enough to stand apart from uh, sort of the consensus body of, of different ideologies in the Irish revolution to some degree. Um, certainly on a practical level, I think he represents like th throughout his first half and second half, um, this this sort of um, character that stands alone in a lot of ways. And so that's where I would go back to what the real ideology of, of the Irish Revolution was about that should have carried into actual government policy that unfortunately De Valera became that veil of, um, was that of Arthur Griffith and him writing in things like um, his Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin policy papers. And what he wanted was he, he's writing explicitly, I want Ireland to export to, to Japan, to Argentina, to America. Like I wanna go as broad as we can. I wanna do export led development. Um, I wanna bring ideas in. Um, Griffith was also very much like a cosmopolitan. The, the man was reading every day in the national library and uh, was super interested in, in sort of consolidating uh, ideas from the globe into uh, all of his papers. And so the idea that then you compare those two men and then you look at De Valera and he's this very insular person. He's, you know, a mathematician by trade. Um, uh, you know, he talks about the ideas of frugal comfort uh, and he's very deferential to the Catholic church. So I think there was this uh, personality trait that was just much more closed off. And he wasn't mm -hmm. actually, I think, a great, um, in a positive way, a reader of the cosmopolitan, of, of, in, of seeing what works from everywhere and mm -hmm. taking bits and pieces to then aggrandize your own local um, society. Um, and so I think, yeah, the, the, and just to finish that off, uh, as a clear example, the best view that just had a reverberation from the Griffith era into um, the 20s and 30s was uh, Ardna Krusha, the Shannon Hydro plant, 
that took a huge sum of state money that was mm. probably like at the moment of inception seen as a boondoggle. Why are the Irish getting involved with this? Uh, but it ends up supplying almost 100% of Irish electricity demand up until the 1950s. Um, mm. And it was it was the, the most advanced engineering uh, hydroelectric plant uh, up until the Hoover Dam was constructed, which is kind of kind of like a shocking statement to make when we think of all the baggage that the Irish inherit of you know the inferiority complex, and then doing that after a revolution, after a civil war, and then somehow making it all work. Yeah, it's just yeah, it just goes to show. I mean, I think um, that's why it's hard to start a new country. Um, because you can get uh, you can get a lot right. You can get you know that was a tricky project. Getting rid of the English was tricky, um, but you had one maybe r dodgy idea, which is that we shouldn't ex we shouldn't export, uh, and that ends up having huge consequences. And but like it's only through trial and error that you work out all those those kinks of and those mistakes of judgment. And not like we've had a hundred years, but hundred years isn't very long to fig to fix to fix the kind of random misjudgments and mistakes that you that you get made along the way. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I feel now about the Irish state. It's sort of it's a hundred years old. It's able. It's kind of figured out some stuff. It's good at some stuff, uh, as good as anywhere. But like, yeah, it's still working out the kinks of some very important part uh, facets of Irish life. Great. So we just we just left off with um, reviewing uh, the state of Irish economy and ideology and, and the history of it. So using this as a little transition, um, let's get back into a specific case of where the Irish state or the Irish private sector can do a better job, which is in urban planning. So you recently wrote a piece that kind of explored some ideas in urban planning, um, adjacent pieces around housing policy and transportation. So can you dive into what is your basic pitch of the problem of urban planning, for, especially for Dublin, and what are the solutions? Um, well, the, there's, it's got one problem which is very common, which is that uh, it's, the, the planning system is quite restrictive. So we've got all these urban, urban jobs have shown up um, in, in the last 20 years. Uh, highly paid urban, jo urban jobs. Uh, they support scads of other urban jobs near to them. So, you know, we need a lot of people, a lot of people need to live in the cities now that didn't need, need to live there before. Uh, people are moving to Ireland to take those jobs. The birth rate in Ireland is relatively high. It's high by European standards, uh, not by absolute standards maybe, but it's relatively high. Anyway, a lot of demand for housing. And we haven't built enough and that's won't be really like news to anybody who's like followed policy in like the rich world, um, all over the rich world. So that's not that's not that unusual. But it's very acute here. It's very acute. Like the housing that the house prices house price is are not massively out as not crazy here actually, um, and that's the consequence of it going back to our financial system. The financial system got a wrap in the knuckles after the last crisis. It wasn't allowed to lend very like freely, so it doesn't do that. So the, the like credit hasn't fueled house prices to a massive extent here. They're just they are very expensive, but no more than in lots of other places. But rents are very high here. Um, I think there's kind of a substitution effect, maybe where people who would have bought houses are kind of stuck in the rental market. Um, at the same time, we've done some kind of clumsy rent control stuff, which has um, kind of cause p uh, landlords to exit the market um um yes sorry well i will get in too deep too deeply into the details of that you can go on forever about that but basically supply and demand of housing is out of whack and housing is too expensive um the other the thing that's distinctive about irish urban policy though which is is that ireland is a uniquely or an unusually centralized state and i've heard actually you might like this like a theory that it's it's a kind of a, a vestige of the um colonial times that the 
you know, when we were part of the United Kingdom, that the London government wasn't going to like wasn't going to like devolve power to a colony like Ireland. Didn't trust us to do that centralized power in London. Um, so the result is like so Ireland when we in, took over ourselves, we just sort of like inherited all the old institutions, and so. Um, to give you a sense of how centralized it is, I think like our our national budget, like five percent or six percent of the, of our gov government spending goes through local authorities, whereas in you know, in the United States, I don't know the number of the United States, but it's like got to be like a third or a half or something like that. In Denmark, which is a comparable country in many ways, it's like fifty five percent. Like what our, our level of local government spending is tiny and even that six percent is actually mostly like passed through because they administer a big social program so they don't spend very much money uh besides that they don't have autonomy uh you've got so what what, what it results in is a country where every all of these departments are siloed you know you have a vertical housing health transport whatever and they all like converge in dublin and you don't, and, 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 and as someone said before to me, like you don't get a, a person in the Irish government who has responsibility across different subject matter areas across the department until you reach the desk of the Taoiseach. <laughs> like, and that's obviously ridiculous. It's, that's a choke point. Mm -hmm. So any problem that requires like cross discipline cross like whatever it is whatever the term is like um all these like common ordinary problems of city governance where you're like oh i want to fix up i'm from limerick right we've got like limerick, limerick wants to do up its main street and it's kind of a, a, a bore a normal main street full of traffic but they want to like make it nice and pedestrianize it and stuff so it's obvious like it should happen but there's a bus route going through it and for the Limerick local authority to, to do the thing they want to do, like pedestrianize the main street, they have to get the bus, the National Transit Authority the authority to sign off on it. The National Transit Authority doesn't give a crap about Limerick's public realm. All it cares about is the efficiency of buses. That's what it's designed to do. So it says like, no, you can't do that. So you can't, you can't divert our, a bus route by one block did you get this like enormous benefit for your community? Mm -hmm. So that's one example. Um, another might be like, it makes it very difficult to master plan your city. You know, if you want, like if you're serious, so you're, serious, so you're, like as in Ireland, your city is, city is full and we want to build more city. Like the way, you, if you're thinking about this with a blank sheet of paper, like the way you do it is like, okay, well, like, like Sim City, you know, like, all right, I'll organize like the sewers and the roads. Get them organized first and like maybe a oh yeah a train station I'll have a train station in the middle of it and that will transport like three two thirds you can do the calculations like oh yeah that train line can transport two thirds of the people in this number of houses build the houses around that you know blah, blah, blah. um but like obviously that's the efficient way to do it and the obvious way to do it and the coordinated way to do it but if you have a governance system which is designed with all these verticals you can't do that because like the department of housing doesn't know anything about transport Department of Transport doesn't know anything about housing. They're just they both have separate goals, um, so they don't they never work together to integrate. Um, like likewise, you know, you get you end up building like a national a national children's hospital or a national hospital rather maternity hospital like on on a beach on the east coast of the country, which is you know in the most in the least accessible spot to like anyone outside of Dublin. But like Department of Health doesn't they're just doing their job like they've got that's the best site for them. So yeah, I think that's the, that's apart from the sort of regular old problems of supply and demand and planning and housing, um, the unique one is is local government is powerless, and it results in like all these problems. The ones I've talked about. Another sorry, just while I'm ranting, another one yeah. is like public. There's another one is like public realm. Like everyone rightly gives out about like how crap Dublin's public public realm is. You know, it's like you're like why can't we have uh you know like nice paving that isn't covered in signs and stuff like why why can't we just like build like a relatively peaceful place in the center of the city or why can't we have um 
traveled on public transport without getting attacked like that's that's a big problem now but like all of these problems like is they're multi-discipline multi whatever what's the term multi-department multidisciplinary yeah, yeah. kind of they, they, inter they interact you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. um and unless you have an, a mayor who can who is accountable who has a transport budget and a police budget and a roads budget and they can knock heads together the guys the, the head of like the head of dublin transport dublin police and can say you guys figure it out i don't care i don't care get me an answer you don't solve these problems so like they're, they're the other kind of problems that don't get solved in ireland the ones that require collaboration and i think that's a feature of our local government yeah well that's that's fascinating because you know so much is you hear in mainstream is just like you know it's the dollar question or the the money the euro question you know how much money um is there for this resource and we need to pump more or less money into it and it's like this is really an institutional problem as you're describing it it's a it's an organization problem and it, it's not something that gets fixed with just more money it, it, no it, it, it's it's more but like that's rearranging it, oh, it. Our, our, ireland has always had like for sorry ireland for as long as i've been kind of conscious has always had plenty of money to spray around at problems mm -hmm. and any problem that can be solved by spreading money and it has been solved um but we're, what we're left with are the ones that require institutional change yeah yeah and so uh, you know one of the i think most visual things that people often think about um planning in ireland is how the Irish rail system, you know, you can see these gifts all the time around the internet, uh, where it was, you know, a hundred years ago to the diminishment of it over time into where it's like, a, it's a shell of its former sort of capacity. So like, wh what do you place at the foot of like, why did that happen? And why is there such lackluster um, emphasis on actually building a rail system that is on par with a lot of uh, peers in Europe and other places? I mean, I think that that's, to be fair, like that was, I'm actually up in Donegal and like Donegal, if you're familiar with it, is like, it's, it's so empty, you know, mm -hmm. it's really, it's really like not very densely populated and there's no industry here and it's very quiet. But I saw some old footage, like path A footage of, there's this like, this now disused, but there's this rail line that goes like through the mountains here. And like, has this big, like, there used to be like an, an a kind of, a, not a viaduct viaduct has water but a bridge let's say big long bridge amazing engineering path footage anyway of like tens of thousands of local peasants essentially getting on the train and commuting into Derry city to work in the shirt the, the shirt factories used to be there um which is just amazing like if you see the place now the idea that there would be commuters and tens of thousands and it's just like beyond crazy but like I, I think to be fair like that is uh that was just a function of technology right like that you get you had that in almost everywhere in the world like that there used to be trains to every mm -hmm. to the to the you know to the coast trains everywhere people didn't have cars they had bicycles so trains were, were like once car once cars were invented they displaced trains and la 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 um but yeah like Ireland, I guess, why is this? So that, yeah, yeah, I think, I think like, it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the biggest train fan ever, but you have to admit that cars are quite convenient for getting around in like areas with like low population density in rural areas. And you wouldn't want, I don't think a train is to probably the optimal technology for, for serving that purpose. Yeah, I, I can understand that. And certainly like certain parts of the US are, are that way, which is why it's so car centric. Um, I think there could be a little bit of like a chicken egg thing too going on of just, well, do you need a rail system that enables um, sort of furthering of different industrializations more of on a medium scale um, if you build it? Um, you know, is, mm -hmm. is there something around the idea of creating that sort of public option of mass transit that can facilitate more circulation? Um, oh yeah, I mean around, like com com yeah. commuter rail, like within the cities, that, like there's no, there's no excuse for not for, for not doing it but i guess sorry there is there is an excuse the excuse is that uh like we said there are various departments don't talk to each other but like for a sensible country that's like that's the way you would do it isn't it you would build electrified commuter rail all around your city going like and uh high frequency and you build you put your homes around it it just makes all the sense in the world and it's not that hard to do yeah yeah and so um so I'd say as like your, your sort of summing up here of 
you're looking at Dublin and we're looking at just that as the specific example to fix because that's such a sore spot for most people. Um, you know, it doesn't have a sufficient transportation network. Um, it doesn't have sufficient um, managing of rental prices. And so what would be like the quick solutions you could do maybe overnight to solve that? Um, overnight quick solutions to solve Dublin's problems. I mean, first Easy thing question. I would be doing, <laughs> yeah, I mean, first thing I'd be doing is like, we have high construction costs in Ireland and that's a real like headwind as we try to solve the housing crisis and fix affordability and stuff. And it just makes like new construction less viable. You get less apartment buildings getting built because it's just, they're just too expensive to build. Um, but part of it is that we have these like kind of, I'm slightly overstating it, but like these like Rolls Royce minimum standards for, for, um, for, for new development, for new development of new homes. So like they're kind of coming from, a, it's coming from the right place. Uh, the planners have said that new homes must be of a certain size and certain quality, um, but they sh they overshot it and they made the minimum standards quite high, such that it costs like four hundred and fifty thousand euro to build the cheapest possible apartment. That's just hard construction costs, not not land, um, and that's that's a shame because there are a lot of people who would who would happily live in a smaller apartment if it were offered to them and by mandating that the apartments be large they don't get them so i would definitely be fixing that um bring just bring it in more in line with european standards like our minimum apartment sizes are much bigger than you get in the rest of europe um so i mean um some street votes have you heard about street votes no street votes are good i hope they i hope they hope they happen in ireland it's just, I think there might be a small chance that they do, but they are a really smart idea. Um, so they come from the come from these guys over in the UK. UK has very similar problems to Ireland. Um, not enough supply. Um, planning system is, is getting in the way and, and kind of gumming up the system. Um, and their planning system, like ours, it's it's like it's a little different from the American one. The American one is like in the American system, the city sort of passes these like zoning ordinances and laws that say like you know you have to have you can't this this is legal this is illegal it's illegal to build let's say you know a multi multi to build an apartment block in a certain area or whatever it might be in ireland and in the uk it doesn't work like that there aren't like specific rules but there are planners who sort of use their wisdom to adjudicate on whether or not anything should be legal um and it's very, very difficult to reform that system. There's a lot of interest groups who don't want things to change. Uh, the UK has a longer history than we do of trying to reform it uh, because it's been a, an acute problem there for longer than it is here. Um, and as someone said, like, you know, lots of, lots, of, lots of housing ministers have been carried off the battlefield on their shields trying to reform it um, from the, the NIMBYs in, in suburban swing constituencies or the planners who like the power that's vested in them and as these interest groups lock it down so rather than trying to reform the system uh they basically propose a separate route through planning that gets to the same destination of 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 being allowed to build and so street votes is what it is it's the idea is that you get a bunch of people together on a street um you propose to people, someone on the street proposes like okay we have this like terrace let's say of two-story homes what if we're allowed if we were allowed to build a third story on our on our terrace um if the majority or a super majority of people vote for it like 60 percent or whatever then people on the street are not not alone allowed but they have the right to do it so there's no planning required if the, if the thing passes you can build a very specific type of development to a specific standard um um so why would anyone do that? Why would someone vote for it? They'd vote for it because even if they don't themselves want to build a third story onto their two story home, they get the right to do it. And that is sort of like an option value on their, on the, on the property, increases the value of the property. So it's sort of like, you know, vote, you know, vote yes for 
it's a way of doing it. It, it, it controls the type of development that would be allowed. So this sort of like consensual and and popular is kind of incentivize incentivizes and encourages people to do it because they get this option value on their home, which increases their property value, and it sort of fulfills all these social goals of like suburbs are very aren't very dense. That's the big problem. We want to make them denser. Sorry, there's children running around this car, but um, sorry. By the way, I feel like I should. I've been drinking a beer, right? Just All for, right. The, for the for the for the viewers, it's six o'clock on a Friday in Ireland. It's actually the first. This is the first hour of my of my summer vacation. Um, I know. I know. Uh, you're in. You're in Arizona. You're like eight hours behind or nine hours behind. Yeah, like I'm that. just. So it's not beer I'm just getting off my but, first coffee. Yeah, so yeah. so I'm not like I'm not having a beer at like nine a.m. or something like that. Um. So yeah, so it's it's, it's and like so and socially the social benefit of it is like suburbs get dense. It's a way to kind of to like scrub and repair the suburbs, densify them in a way that's pot, which is sort of the thing that we most need in our cities is for low density inner suburbs to be become dense because that's where it's easiest to get your transport going and all the rest of it um yeah i like that that's a really good one great great well that's uh i think a good place to end i know you have a hard stop so uh this has been a i think a good conversation uh if you'd like to give plugs of all where people can find you any big projects you got coming up please go forward well sure just look hit me up on twitter and okay. join take join sign up for the email go to twitter on Twitter, you see a sign up link for my investing investing email once a week. And while you're at it, you see the currency, which is the, the publication I work for. And you can take out a trial subscription to the currency and see if it floats your boat. Yeah. Great, great overall content on that too. Just a good publication. Oh, thanks, Peter. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Peter. All right. <laughs>